storms tore through this neighborhood. The race back home here at the Trop tonight, the fans are definitely excited. Neighbors we spoke to on this normally quiet cul-de-sac were shocked by the flurry of police activity that occurred here last night. First on Fox this morning, the drama surrounding the 2011 budget might be coming to a close, but another battle may soon be brewing in Congress. Iran's Revolutionary Guard just began new military exercises. It's another show of force by Iran after also threatening to shut down a major oil supply route. Police chased Harris to Hubert and Henderson, but unfortunately he turned down this dead end street. Many of the people that are out here slept outside in their cars just outside the shelter, but a lack of sleep or the sweltering Florida heat was not going to keep them away. Authorities are confident that he acted alone and that he planned the attack for months. We are back now live with more of our continuing coverage of the final preparations of the Republican National Convention. Now to the RNC. Strip clubs might not be the most politically correct venue for those attending the Republican National Convention. All right, he always knows what's going on with this sort of thing. Hey, how far did they actually get last week? Well, we know they brought in 500 people in total to come down to the courthouse. They brought in Trayvon Martin's dad the day after the shooting. They played that 911 call for him, and this is what the officer wrote in the report. I asked Mr. Martin, in, is the voice calling for help was that of his son? Mr. Martin, clearly emotionally impacted by the recording, quietly responded no. And what they're going to do in closing argument is basically point out surgically every single time they changed his story that kind of made an impact about where he was going and making Trayvon Martin more of the criminal than the victim. Take a look. I'm not going to do some drama and drop it on the floor. Well, we want to bring in Assistant State Attorney Felix Vega now. You've been watching this with us all along. Not guilty. A shock to a lot of people. And in this case, they had three opportunities to convict a murder or manslaughter or find him not guilty. It's very difficult for the jury to make those decisions. And also why the case came to be the way it was. Angela Corey gave a press conference just a few moments ago. Here's how she explained their decision to file the charges the way that they did. We also promised that we would seek the truth for Trayvon Martin. We have to accept and respect the jury's verdict in the end regardless. Felix Vega with us again tonight, and uh, we'll be checking in with you a little bit later on. Thank Thanks, you. Deborah. So how did that lead to wedding bells ringing there this weekend? Well, it was an interesting way in which they decided the case because they totally disregarded all the equal protection arguments that everyone thought that they were going to rule on that would have made a more sweeping decision for same-sex couples all over the entire country. What and it was a scary situation because these two guys were so off the radar that they never envisioned not only that it would be you know people from Chechnya, that they were one of them was an American citizen. Sports story. <laughs> especially when it relates to the law. There's a lot of complex issues to this entire story, especially with Junior Seau's case, but it was really the first comprehensive lawsuit that we were able to get our hands on. This has been one of the most fascinating cases and really fast moving because last weekend when we were here, we were talking about Aaron Hernandez possibly being arrested on an obstruction charge. We knew that did not come to fruition. He was later arrested on murder charges. This involved a case where him, Carlos Ortiz, and Ernest Wallace, two co-defendants of his, are accused of murdering Odin Lloyd. And just mm. yesterday, I pulled this story Indianapolis Colts safety Joe Lefajed. He was arrested this weekend yesterday morning on gun charges in Washington. He makes number 29. Why are these veterans charities easy targets? Well, it became apparent in this 130 page application for the search warrant that outlined the entire scam that Chad Burns was running. Well, it was extraordinary that she was even even able to give the interview to Fox 10 and we have a little piece of sound I want to play for you. Take a look at what she had to say. I believe death is the ultimate freedom, so. Uh, strictly Perkins loans for these lawsuits and started with the University of Pennsylvania and George Washington University and also Yale. They started going after students because these are actually privately held loans by the university, even though they're federally funded. You have to have an ID to do a lot of things. Why not have an ID to vote? And that was interesting because that was the argument in Pennsylvania for having their law in place. So the judge in the lower court in Pennsylvania said, well, we use ID for everything in our daily lives. And so, but here in Florida, for example, when you go to the, the polls and you vote, you can use anything from your registration card, you got your student ID, your debit card, your driver's license, even your passport. It's, it's, it just shows you how things have changed with social media. Definitely. And it's a very good thing, not only with social media, but also for the media itself to be involved and the cooperation between law enforcement and the media in this case as well. A lot to cover what we did. Yes, yes. And you always do such a great job. Thanks, Thank Kristen. Thank you so much. Good day continues right after this. With those prescription drug cases, we see minimum mandatory sentences that are attached to them when a lot of people are actually users and actual addicts. Correct. How are you seeing your office handled not only getting them the resources that they need, but also what do you think needs to be changed or tweaked about 
the drug trafficking statute so someone that is a true addict can get the help and not be um, facing 25 years in prison right out the gate. I think, I think we all have to sit down and be realistic and say, you know what, there are in fact, as you say, addicts and users. And we have to address the fact that right now, possession of a small number of pills or possession of, of a prescription bottle that doesn't belong to you carries, whether it be a, a 15 year or 25 year minimum mandatory. The cost of that to our state, the impact that that has on our communities has got to be realistically looked at. One other focus of your administration is the fight against pill mills and prescription drug abuse here in the state of Florida. Uh, we've seen a lot of laws be, being passed since you and Governor Scott uh, took office. More laws went into effect, a different part of the law actually, uh, in January. Where do you see the fight going forward from here through the rest of your administration and even in the next couple of years? And Felix, you and I know as career prosecutors how bad that the drug problem is, not only in Florida, but throughout the state. But something I didn't know until I really got around the state of Florida was how bad the prescription drug problem was. We have seven Floridians a day overdosing from prescription drugs. And they had tried for over six years to pass legislation and couldn't do it, and it was absolutely ridiculous. Pam, thank you so much. I thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, Felix. Thank you. And you're doing a great job on the docket. Thank you. When you found that out, why was that the, the breaking point for you where you needed to start telling your story? I got the call from my daughter, and um, it was her father, and she called me to tell me that um, he, she, he had just murdered his girlfriend. And I was devastated. In fact, I was on my way to work. Um, and I just couldn't stop crying. I was just so devastated, thinking that if I would have stayed in that situation, that would have been me. You know, it could have been me. It's a relaxing drive like this up the Suncoast Parkway and a good deal on a new home that attracted Tim and Megan Long to one Pasco County subdivision in 2006. We couldn't compete with the prices down in Tampa. I mean, there was no way we could afford it. It was the best price for the area and we had an easy way to get to the veterans and get to work. And that's why Tim and Megan moved here to Suncoast Meadows and the quiet suburban street of Clover Blossom Circle. But their dream quickly became a nightmare. Uh, first time we found out was about uh, two years ago when the HOA notified us they were looking into it against Lennar uh, to find out why uh, you know the methane tests were, uh, were were higher than they were supposed to be and what the whole ideal was with the methane and the landfill. It's this giant field on the back side of the property that covers the landfill that was initially discovered. What was more disturbing to Tim was the testing going on right behind them. So over here you're going to look at the, that's the actual landfill area. If you look all the way into the back all the way to the back right, you'll see a little building, and the little the little white building is actually where they where they actually watch the testing of the landfills for the uh, methane levels. And all along the streets, you find metal caps like these covering methane wells used to monitor the levels of methane gas underneath. As Tim spent more and more time going over his contract and then the HOA declarations, he learned a lot more about where he lived, and the more he started to question why he was living here. This contract over here, this was with it like this. When they signed the contract for their house, the only mention of the landfill was buried deep in the back of the Homeowners Association rules, not in the contract itself. And then it says no trenching or digging. Well, what about, what about the, the pools? This is the pool Tim is talking about, a pool deck built right on the edge of that same field that covers the landfill. A uh, buyer has to be notified by the seller that a landfill is in the area. Why didn't Lennar, did Lennar tell us that originally? This is what's weird. Like, see how bad it is? It's like a new neighborhood. As we walked the streets, Megan was quick to point out massive cracks in the pavement, a sign of what may lie underneath. What Tim and Megan also didn't know was how far that landfill went underground. They've explained to us, but we don't know for a fact that that, um, that line they've drawn is real. I mean, how do you know that? unless you bring somebody out independently and have them actually do a testing and say this is where the real line is. Had he known more up front, buying a home in Suncoast Meadows wouldn't have happened so quickly. When Tim and Megan moved into this house, they expected to stay here a long time and even start raising a family. But with a new baby on the way, their only concern is not just about selling the home, but also staying here at all. I'm, I'm concerned about it because we found out three months ago that we're going to have a child in July. And, uh, and for us to hear from the the uh, fire department that there's a risk of an explosion uh, happening two streets over from me 
and we don't know what's in the soil either. So obviously there is a risk that why would I want to live in a home that I don't know what could be the damage to my kid or to myself or my wife 20 years from now. As for selling their home in the long run, Tim is not very optimistic. So how, what are the chances of us being able to sell a house in here? There's no telling if it really could happen or not. And I want, I want somebody to give us the truth of what's in the soil, what's in the air. We need to find out from the state by independently being having testing done to see what we're talking about here.